This is the end of the tour, so it's like the last day. It's been a really in intense run. I'm sure when I go on stage it'll be fine, but like, wow, I feel really, really anxious. Like my heart's just racing. Usually I have one of those gel packs that athletes, you know, take, the sugar packs, before I go on and then in like 10 minutes time it will kick in and it'll be, it'll be good. Venues, please take note and put tampons in your toilets. Since Rina Sawayama broke out into the music scene in 2017, she has been doing it her way. She's campaigned to change rules for the Brit Awards, landed a Hollywood role, come out as pansexual, and has been hailed as the future of queer pop music. And I've come to ask her how she got to this point and what's next. Welcome to In Conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's surreal. How would you describe this particular moment in your life? It feels like so much has happened in the past few years. The first phrase that comes to mind is probably a sigh of relief. I think, you know, my career really took off during the pandemic. And I'll, I'm so grateful for that, you know. It, it was really unexpected. But at the same time, I worked solidly through the pandemic, then out of the pandemic, then since then I haven't stopped. And the majority of the work I've been doing after the pandemic was touring because everyone like me, all the artists were catching up on the tour dates that we had to cancel for two years. And so it was non-stop. You were born in Japan and you moved to the UK when you were a child. What was that like? What are your memories of that time? Yeah, back then it was hard because I couldn't speak English, you know. Um, culture is, it couldn't be more different. Uh, priorities couldn't be more different. And I remember all through my childhood and adolescence really struggling with this home life, of very Japanese home life, Japanese cooking, Japanese lunches, my mum speaking Japanese to me, you know, her not necessarily being able to help with like homework, for example, and then straddling that with London and in particular central London, like state school life. And um, I remember being really, you know, pulled in two directions. How much do you think straddling two cultures has affected you as an artist? Well, you know, my first single for my first record was STFU. And I wrote that because I grew up with this sense of, I guess now I recognise as anger, that I had to always be representative of my race. And at the time I was in my mid twenties or mid to late twenties and I had gone to one too many weddings where someone would come up to me and they'd, they'd start talking to me and maybe the first couple of things would be quite standard, what's your name? But then, then on it would just be about Japan. It would be about how I looked, where's your parents from? And I remember thinking, wow, I've done so much. I feel like I've got an interesting life. I went to Cambridge, studied politics. I, I was seeing conversations happening with other people who aren't Japanese or whatever. And the conversation would be like, oh yeah, so what are you up to these days? What are you, you know, doing in your spare time? But for me, it was like, oh, I'd love to go to Japan sometime. And I just became like, I felt like what people saw of me was this map of Japan. It wasn't me as a person. And I remember feeling so frustrated growing up because that is, that's been the story of my life. And sure, it's positive. 
everyone loves Japan, that's amazing. But truthfully, I didn't grow up in Japan. I think a lot of, you know, immigrants or first gen, you know, immigrants can really uh, relate to that. It's a, it's a very tricky relationship that we have to navigate our whole lives. And when did music become this, you know, idea of something to do as a living and not just kind of hanging out with your friends and having fun? It was really natural to me that I would think about the music industry, but I had no idea, no connections. I don't know how to get in. The, so I, I just worked like normal jobs, like office jobs. I was a loan administrator for a, like nearly a year and I was a nail technician doing pedicures and uh, I was working in an ice cream shop. I worked at the Apple store. But the, the, when I quit my, all my part-time jobs was when I was about 27. So that's when I became kind of full-time musician. See, 27, I think, is young. I, th well, I, I think, think so I think, too. I think, I think 30s is young. Like 30s kind of, is young. But I did see a tweet from you that, that where you said that you had felt pressure to, to lie about your age. Yeah. What, 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 where did you feel that pressure from? Just the standard. Um, the kind of accepted standard of pop musicians when I was growing up, especially in 90s, 2000s, is that you get signed when you're 13 or maybe 16, 17 at the oldest, and then you are in development and you're a full-time artist. And, and so at the point that I signed my first record contract, and when I say record contract, I mean album contract, um, was I was 29. So I felt old. And it is maybe. an industry that fetishizes youth. It does, it, it does. It, and luckily now I think it is changing slowly. Um, and. Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be very young artists and exceptional artists, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that necessarily, but I do think that it's nice to see a slight shift towards not thinking that people in their 30s are too old to be on screen. Yeah. Have you, have you felt pressure about not being able to be forthright about other things? Yeah, well, a, I think there's, listen, I think there's a lot of things that people outside of the music industry don't know about the music industry. It's, it's been something I've been really thinking about recently because of the SAG AFRA um, strikes. That's the, the actors strike. The that's actors currently strikes. Currently ongoing. Currently ongoing. Um, to talk about working conditions for actors across the scale. Yes, and what really struck me was the kind of conversation, not only about the working conditions, hours, and all that. This conversation about royalties and AI. That's a huge threat to the AI music, is. artificial intelligence. Yeah. So it's. Uh, they're arguing that they can not only use people's words that real humans have written and then extrapolate that into something else, they can use people's voices and deep fake that into another advert that they haven't signed up for or without extra pay. And royalties are, I mean, it's basically how um, actors and writers get paid. Um, they'll, but the parallels between that and music is very close. Mm. What's our future? Like, our contracts currently don't have anything to do with AI. Um, and it's really made me think a lot about, wow, like record, recording artists in particular have very little rights as, you know, if, when you compare it to what actors have. And yeah. I, it, it's made me think, it's made me think, wow, I think there needs to be some sort of overhaul because currently it's really very much benefiting music labels and record labels and not the artist. So your second album, Hold the Girl, you've talked about kind of the process of writing it. Could you tell us a bit more about it? Yeah, it was a very intense album to write. Uh, like a lot of people did in lockdown, I had some realizations of my own and I was quite, I was really struggling mentally, but with something quite specific that I'd never addressed in my life. And I've actually never talked about this in any other interview. This is the first time I'm talking about this, but essentially through doing um, sex therapy, sex and relationship therapy, I realized that a rela uh, something that I thought was a relationship that I had when I was 17 was actually I was groomed. And why it happened then, why that realization happened in my 30s was because I was finally his age. And so therefore there's a song called Your, Your Age, Age in the record because I looked, you know, there's a school down my road, secondary school, and 17, you know, you're in secondary school. And to ever think that that could be ever acceptable 
for me to look at a 17 year old and think that oh yeah that's that's fine or that you know that I could you know try and go for them it I, rem I remember distinctly how uncomfortable that made me, but I didn't put the two and two together. And it was through this very intense form of therapy, which I feel so lucky to be able to have ac her access to, that I was able to come to terms with it. And it completely broke my whole world apart. Because at the time, after, you know, it came to light that that was what was happening in my, in my school, basically it was a school teacher, I was so badly slut-shamed that I developed so much shame around my sexuality and lost completely my sense of self. I detached from my skin, like inside, I don't know like how to describe it, but I just felt so afraid of things and I'd have anxiety attacks and all of that. Was that dissociation with your body. Exactly, that numbness. And I, you know, in, in doing the therapy, it was about, you know, revisiting that in a child, the 17 year old who went through that and holding her close and telling her it was not her fault. And that was a very, very emotional process, as you can imagine. And it actually then led to the song Hold the Girl. And it's, you know, it's about realizing that you go through a lot of things when you're young. Some things are more messed up than others. Some people have more trauma than others but you're often, more often than not, you're just a child. You have no agency in that situation. 17 to me is a child. You're in school. Um, you have no autonomy most, most of the time. And especially if you're in a school setting, you know, if a school teacher is you know, coming onto you, that's an abuse of power. But I didn't realize that until I was his age. And so writing that album was one of the hardest things, but also when I finished it, it was one of the most incredible experiences. And now it makes me so happy when I see, you know, especially like women or femmes in the audience connecting to it because I haven't talked about this in specifics. I've just said, you know, it's about a period in my life when I was younger. And, but I know the truth. And when I look out to the audience and I see femmes or women connecting to it, I'm like, maybe you know, maybe you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you're feeling it right now. Rena says it's important for her to have a close team around her, one that she's carefully built. You, you keep a close community of people around you. I've met a lot of the people who you work with. Is that like a deliberate choice to keep that, um, you know, unit around you, kind of really diverse and really close? Yeah. You know, in different parts of what I do, I think it's really important because uh, a lot of different parts of it has been just straight white men for a long time. The music industry, even if you know you look at the heads of music industry, still it is straight white men. Um, so, you know, I try and work with people who could also be my friend. And also, I work with people who I want to see more of in the industry. Do you feel freedom to speak openly because you've set the kind of dynamics of how you will speak openly about certain things, like microaggressions and sexism and ageism? Like you've set a culture where you're going to be honest about a lot of things in the music industry. Yeah. I have always wanted to lead with the truth. Always. I think that truth and educating the public and you know breaking open the trans like making it transparent is really important to me the people that you reference in your songs like Whitney and Britney and mm. those artists that we've seen in front of us and you know we've seen that career play out where they didn't feel autonomy about their career has that inspired you in some way yeah sadly my heroes are the bad examples you know the examples where it's gone not so good has destroyed their career or their lives um, and but I can see how that can happen obviously on my level it's so much smaller but I see the culture of it I see this protection that people place around artists that actually doesn't protect the artist at all it just hides things from them and yeah and it's sad that it's this way but I do feel that there is some truth to what I'm trying to explore which is this clear understanding and transparency of our 
who owns what, you know, what you know, what your rights are, I think that's one of my kind of key things. Do you feel completely free right now? Yeah, yeah, very much. For you, will your music always be autobiographical or do you see it, or your art, not just music, your, you know, aspects of your creativity, will you always put parts of yourself in it or will there just be parts where it's just, I'm just going to put some paint on a canvas <laughs> and you can do what you want. <laughs> oh, honestly, after releasing Hold The Girl, I was like, I have no more, I have no more. I don't want any more traumas to come out. I don't want any more. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm talking about myself. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope that I don't have to write autobiographically all the time. My story is not the most important story to tell. There's a lot of stories to be told, you know? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm very excited about the third record because I've learned so much from the first, so much from the second, and not just musically, but just in terms of the creation of it, writing, producing, and mixing, I've learned so much. So I'm excited, yeah. I don't know what I'm gonna write about yet, but I would love a day where I can just write a song that's just about love or sex or, you know, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Thank you so much. Thank you.